good morning, everybody, and welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Bunn's Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. For those new to these webinars, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and technologies at their infancy. We use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. <clears throat> One theme that we have been researching is metabolic health, or increasingly the absence of metabolic health. Metabolic health comprises so much of what we focus on at iSelect. It touches healthful and sustainable food systems, chronic disease management, longitudinal data, cutting edge biomarkers, and a massive opportunity to do well and do good. For these reasons and others which we will cover in today's webinar, metabolic health is of increasing interest to iSelect. A few process comments. We are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. We've invited you to this because you are technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopter customers, or sophisticated investors that are part of the iSelect network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic, and would greatly appreciate it if you actively engage during the presentation. We will have Q&A open throughout the, the presentation, and then we'll have hopefully some time towards the end to get to any questions um, that remain. So thank you in advance for your attendance and active participation. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I'm pleased to bring you this week's deep dive on metabolic health. So quick uh, table of contents. We'll do some quick speaker introductions. We have a great, uh, a great crew uh, of doctors here today to, to tell us about their work and their research and their companies. Um, I will introduce, introduce them here in just a second. Um, then we'll get into some background. I will briefly give some overview uh, on kind of metabolic health trends and uh, how iSelect is thinking about it and thinking about the opportunity. And then we'll get right into the expert discussion. Um, finally, as I mentioned, we will have some time for conversation and Q&A. <clears throat> so again, a big thank you to our guests. We have uh, a great, great crew today. Um, we'll start with Sarah Gottfried. Um, Sarah is the director of the Precision Medicine Program at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health uh, at Jefferson Health. She's a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Integrative Medicine and Nutritional Science at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Gottfried has developed novel clinical programs that are highly personalized with a focus on scientific wellness and grounded in deep phenotyping of the gene environment interface. She explores innovative ways of optimizing performance, energy, metabolism, hormones, muscle mass, bone density, sexual function, gut brain issues, and healthy aging. She's the New York Times best-selling author of three books, The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. And she just came out with a new book called Woman, Food, and Hormones. She is an expert in functional medicine and is one of the nation's top physicians for evidence-based bioidentical hormone therapy for women and men. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Secondly, we have Dr. Casey Means. Casey Means is a Stanford-trained physician Chief Medical Officer and Co-Founder of Metabolic Health Company Levels, and Associate Editor of the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. Her mission is to maximize human potential and reverse the epidemic of preventable chronic disease by empowering individuals with tech-enabled tools that can inform smart, personalized, and sustainable dietary and lifestyle choices. Dr. Means' perspective has been recently featured in the New York Times, Men's Health, Forbes, Business Insider, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur Magazine, The Hill, Metabolism, Endocrine Today, and more. She has held research positions at the NIH, Stanford School of Medicine, and NYU. Thanks for joining us, Casey. 
And finally, Dr. Mark Kukazella. Dr. Mark Kukazella is a retired Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel and practices family medicine in Ranson and Martinsburg, West Virginia. He is a professor at West Virginia University School of Medicine and conducts continuing medical education courses on health, fitness, and running through Health Fit U and develops the US Air Force Efficient Running Program. <clears throat> Mark has been an advocate for nutritional science and helped develop the Med Chefs Program for West Virginia University School of Medicine and has published several papers on low carbohydrate diet for diabetes and metabolic syndrome. He has also been named a distinguished mountaineer by the governor of West Virginia, a Blue Ridge Outdoors Pioneer, Air Force Athlete of the Year, Colorado Academy of Family Physicians Teacher of the Year, <clears throat> and is inducted in the Marine Corps Marathon Hall of Fame. And has received the President's Award from the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. So thank you all to our guests today and excited to get into uh, the conversation. So a little bit of background here, uh, just on what metabolic health is. So we've all heard the word metabolism uh, probably since we were uh, just kids. And you might think uh, you have a fast or slow metabolism and that it's kind of static, um, but it turns out that's not really the case. So metabolism uh, was kind of all the chemical and cellular reactions that produce and store energy from food in the human body. Um, and it turns out when things aren't ideal, we get what's called metabolic syndrome. And as you can see here, metabolic syndrome is diagnosed when someone has three or more of the following uh, ailments. So that's high blood glucose, which we'll talk about um, in greater detail today from all three of our, our great guests. Uh, that's you know blood, blood sugar levels, uh, low levels of HDL or the good cholesterol in the blood, high levels of triglyc triglycerides in the blood, large waist circumference, I believe it's above 40 inches for men and above 36 for women, and high blood pressure. Um, and again, it turns out that this is actually fairly rare to, to have absence of, uh, of, these, of these ailments. Um, and a very important and seminal study a couple of years ago the, at the uh, University of North Carolina, it found that only 12% of American adults or about one in eight Americans are metabolically healthy uh, by the metrics um, that I just discussed on the left. So blood glucose, HDL, triglycerides, waste, and high blood pressure. So um, again, very, very rare. And um, what this means, uh, you know, the way I select is looking at it is really as a, as a source of problems downstream of metabolic health. So if you know iSelect, you know we're invested in um, companies related to diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, cancer, um, and you know, tangentially cardiovascular disease. And really the way we're thinking about it is that metabolic syndrome is, is upstream of these, of these diseases, which are um, incredibly taxing on the financial system and incredibly common. Um, so while obviously there's been a lot of money spent on trying to address uh, the symptoms and manifestations of the disease of these diseases. Uh, we at iSelect are increasingly interested in kind of the, the fountain, uh, the, the, the well of, 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 uh, of, of upstream causes uh, that are causing these diseases. And increasingly that's pointing us in the direction of, of metabolic health and how we can uh, really prevent and, and delay onset um, of all these incredibly taxing uh, diseases on the, on the US healthcare system. Um, so that's where, that's where we're coming from, um, and we have, again, a great uh, group of entrepreneurs, physicians, and researchers uh, to help us understand this a little better today. So Dr. Sarah Gottfried is with us. Sarah, thank you for joining. My pleasure, Tom. So happy to be with you, with Joan, and with the iSelect team, and all of our viewers and listeners. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Um, so can, can we start by talking just a little bit about um, why should the average person care about, about metabolic health? And I, I mentioned some of the downstream causes, but how do you kind of frame the problem and, and why should people really pay attention to this? The way I frame the problem is with an analogy. So I was just watching a show called The 100 Foot Wave with my husband last night. And I think that this is a really apt analogy because 
metabolic health has become such a serious problem in this country and really worldwide. And the fact is most people don't know about it. So you mentioned already that about 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. They have at least one of those criteria that you mentioned of metabolic syndrome. But those five criteria, I would say, are somewhat outdated. We can look much deeper at metabolic health, and we can actually predict the transition from health to pre-disease much earlier. So the way that I talk about it with my patients is that metabolic health is really more important than your bank account. It's more important than your retirement account. In fact, you should think about it as your retirement account. Like don't wait until you're 65 to start caring about metabolism. Care about it when you can really do something about it, which is as early in the process as possible. And when it comes to some chronic diseases, whether that's hypertension, coronary heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, these changes are happening under the hood way earlier than you might expect. As soon as in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, certainly by midlife. So that's how I frame it for my patients. And you know, I don't just take care of women as the director of Precision Health. I take care of both men and women. I even take care of professional athletes. And it's amazing to me that you know, NBA players that are playing games uh, during the season right now, they've got typically two to three uh, games per week. They're doing so much training. And yet I can tell you somewhere around 20% of NBA players, at least that I've taken care of, which is an N of 20, have prediabetes. So it's really important to care about this, to understand what's going on with your own metabolic health. And I would even challenge our listeners to, to know what your fasting glucose is. Like at least start there. Don't outsource it to someone else, to a healthcare professional. Know what those numbers are. Awesome. I love the analogy of, of the bank account. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't check your bank account once a year. Um, so why, why check your, your lipid panel and your metabolic panel once a year, because it's frankly as important. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, about some of the, the research you're using to diagnose and, and recognize uh, patients at, at, at an earlier and earlier stage and where you think that's going? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna nerd out with you guys for a moment because I'm trained as a bioengineer. And what we know when it comes to network medicine is that health is a state of homeostasis. When you have a perturbation to that state, that state of uh, balance, kind of um, a steady state, when you have a perturbation that puts you into a pre-disease state, in this case with metabolic health, that would be pre-diabetes, that then can progress to a disease state and a new state of homeostasis. Now, this is this homeostasis, it's not the kind of homeostasis that we want. So as you think about those three points, health to pre-disease to disease, what we know is that along that continuum, the sooner that you intervene, the better. So in my research, what we look at is the earliest biomarkers of the transition from health to pre-diabetes. So we look at a lot of different buckets. I do multiomic phenotyping. So we look at genotype, there's uh, dozens and dozens, uh, hundreds of genes that are involved in the glucose and insulin signal. We look at the microbiome. We look at uh, many other ohms, including the metabolome, the uh, transcriptome, um, ohms that maybe we don't have as much time to get into today. But what we're trying to understand is how does, how does a dense data set help us to identify people who are at risk? And how does that compare to the gold standard? Because the gold standard is that we do a single snapshot while that needle is in your vein. Maybe you go see your primary care doctor once a year and you've got the, the blood draw, the vena puncture. We draw something like a fasting glucose. We look at your hemoglobin A1C. Hopefully you get at least a lipid panel, uh, maybe even an advanced lipid panel. We look at some of these measures that you've mentioned already, like HDL, LDL, so forth, uh, triglycerides. But that is such a limited 
picture of what's going on. You know, the hemoglobin A1C is a, an average of what's been going on for the past three months, and it's not an even average. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's more, uh, the more recent six weeks is more highly represented. So in our work with identifying patients at an earlier stage, we're finding some of these biomarkers that are incredibly important. And I would say leading the pack of biomarkers is the continuous glucose monitor. So we're now doing a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at uh, continuous glucose monitoring as a crucial um, uh, indicator of a change in metabolic health. And some of the data that's been published, including uh, the study that's shown here, indicates that when you have more comprehensive data, such as we get with continuous glucose monitoring, it picks up about 15% more pre-diabetics than the standard biomarkers like fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C, even to our glucose tolerance test. It also picks up 2% more type two diabetics. So looking at these earlier biomarkers, I think is crucial. Fantastic. And I've heard you talk a lot about um, N of one experimentation. Um, I, I, I imagine that N of one experimentation is really focusing on some of these biomarkers, but can you, can you, can we back up and can you explain what N of one experimentation is, why you think it's so crucial and kind of how you are um, using it uh, with, with your patients? So N of one experimentation is probably the most important tool in our toolbox for those of us that practice precision medicine. And the idea is pretty simple. It's just that instead of doing medicine for the average, which is what I was taught to do at Harvard Medical School. So medicine for the average is where you have randomized trials of say interventions for patients with prediabetes. In those randomized trials, you get an answer for a population. It becomes medicine for the average. Now that's also what I would call imprecision medicine. I say that with so much love and respect for my colleagues who practice mainstream medicine. But what I found was that it fails many of my patients. So within precision medicine, what we do is we've got a patient with depression diagnosed uh, with say moderate depression. We treat them with a drug like Celexa. And we know that it's gonna take treating about 10 patients for one to benefit. Now that is in precision medicine. With NF1 experimentation, each patient serves as their own control. You've got a period of uh, control data that you collect, such as with a continuous glucose monitor. And then you have an intervention and you see what happens to the data set. Typically that intervention lasts for about six weeks. So that is an N of one experiment. And what's illustrated here in this slide, you can see that the lower limits of the dotted line are about 70. The upper limits of the dotted line are about, uh, sorry, 80 milligrams per deciliter of glucose. The upper limit is 140 milligrams per deciliter. And in this N of one experiment shown in the red, a patient has a very spiky glucose level. So we're measuring glucose continuously in the interstitial space, typically in the arm, depending on which device you're using or sometimes the abdominal uh, wall. And you can see the spikiness. What we know with glucose, what we know with metabolic health is that spikiness is not good. You don't wanna have severe spikiness, which is also known as a severe glucotype. So this patient had quite a bit of spikiness going up to 200 milligrams per deciliter in response to their food, their standard food, kind of food in the wild. After an intervention, you can see the continuous glucose data superimposed in blue, and you can see that the spikiness is dramatically reduced. So using the language of Michael Snyder's lab at Stanford, in the red, you can see a severe glucotype. In the blue, you can see a mild glucotype. So that's how we use N of one experimentation. I use it with all of my patients. We also have uh, research funding, a restricted gift from Levels that is um, allowing us to do not just the systematic review and meta-analysis of early biomarkers of prediabetes, 
but it's also allowing us to do an exploratory study of deep phenotyping of 12 subjects where we're looking at data such as CGM data before and after intervention. Cool, thank you. And related to that, you know, um, I think what I'm gathering from, from this is that one of the reasons why end of one experimentation is so useful is because everybody uh, is different. Um, and, you know, they have different ways of uh, their, their genes are expressing, have different genes, uh, you know, for, to begin with. Um, and I think one of the things here that I know you're, you're looking into is, is the different ways, the different phenotypes uh, of patients uh, with type two diabetes and what some of the downstream uh, effects and, and maladies are based on those different phenotypes. Um, how are you using this, this data uh, in your practice and, and what do you think the, the long-term implications are? Well, this is another uh, standard concept of precision medicine that we don't take all patients with prediabetes and treat them the same. We don't take all patients with type two diabetes and treat them the same. Instead, what we look for based on this multiomic phenotyping that we perform is uh, different subphenotypes. So if you take the phenotype, kind of the gene environment interaction that leads to type two diabetes, we know that there's probably somewhere around three to six subphenotypes of type two diabetes. So what you're looking at on the right is a topographical analysis from the lab of Joel Dudley at Mount Sinai. And he performed an assessment using dense data from the electronic health rec record put together with genotype data to map out three subphenotypes of type two diabetes. And on the left, you can see these three different phenotypes. He looked at a total of 11,210 hospital outpatients. He found that 2,500 of them were diagnosed with type two diabetes. So he had a pretty robust data set. And he found that subtype one was a cluster of particular conditions, including diabetic nephropathy, diabetic retinopathy. The second subtype shown at the bottom of the illustration was cancer malignancy, mostly lung and bronchus, as well as cardiovascular disease. That's my particular interest. And then subtype three is cardiovascular diseases together with neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, as well as allergies. So all of them have immune components, more of a neurological component in type three. But I think an important note to make here is that when you look at subphenotypes, they've been done for a lot of conditions, such as in this case, type two diabetes, but not so much for the pre-disease state. And that's what I'm particularly interested in because of that homeostasis issue. So we can intervene, we've got a better chance of reversal the earlier in the process that we uh, make an intervention. We also know that when it comes to subphenotypes that um, instead of doing medicine for the average, we think that we can customize treatment based on these subphenotypes. So the concept with precision medicine is that we've probably got somewhere around three to six subphenotypes of prediabetes. Each of them should undergo a different type of N of one experimentation. So that's where we're heading with precision medicine as we look at metabolic health, especially with prediabetes. I'll say one last thing regarding prediabetes. You know, a lot of folks think, well, I don't have to worry about this until I get a diagnosis of type two diabetes. The truth is prediabetes is not just some intermediate risk state. It is associated with its own sequela. So it is associated with a greater risk of kidney dysfunction, probably along this uh, pre-subtype one. It is associated with more uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, associated more with probably pre-subtype two and three, as well as uh, retinopathy and um, damage elsewhere in the body. And that is especially true in women. So you mentioned earlier that with metabolic syndrome, part of the criteria is in men with a waist circumference of 40 or greater. In women, it's actually 35 inches or greater, not 36. I just wanted to correct that, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> and with women, 
we know that the average waist size of women is 37.5 inches. So I would challenge you not just to know what your fasting glucose number is, but know what your waist circumference is so that you are starting to collect your own data set about your metabolic health. Awesome. Well, Dr. Gottfried, it sounds like you are really at the cutting edge and um, from, from the phenotyping point of view, really kind of the tip of the iceberg and excited to see where this research goes and, and how you uh, put it into practice. So thanks for sharing with us. Um, hopefully we'll have some time uh, for some more questions at the end. Sure. Um, but moving on uh, to Dr. Casey Means. Uh, Casey is the co-founder and chief medical officer of Levels, um, which she was gracious enough to let me try. So I have a, a Levels CGM on right now and have been loving it and obsessed with the data and um, had a very active and uh, very uh, low carb weekend um, to try to try to game it. Um, but Casey, can you tell us a little bit about Levels and, and why you started it? Absolutely. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so, so grateful to be here with such wonderful panelists and, and audience. So Levels is the first consumer biosensor program. It empowers individuals to understand how food and lifestyle decisions are affecting their health in real time. Levels members use continuous glucose biosensors to learn the immediate impact of specific choices. And in doing so, this is creating the first closed loop feedback system on food and thereby unlocking the power for us to each make better health decisions that keep our glucose more stable which as we just heard from Dr. Gottfried is foundational for metabolic health and longevity over the long term. It also gives people a much more nuanced view into the current status and the trajectory of their metabolic health long before issues might show up on a standard lab test. Simply put, we're talking about technology that um, facilitates behavior change and personalized choices and also um, highlights the trajectory of health and signals of pre-disease. <clears throat> and I think one way to, to think about it is that, you know, the average person eats three pounds of food per day. We eat about a metric ton of food each year. And this metric ton of molecular information directly determines our, our health outcomes, our gene expression, what our cells are made out of. And yet we have virtually no idea what that food is doing to our body, what the impact is. It's all based on um, food marketing, you know, what we've heard is good for us, but we don't actually know the immediate impact. Additionally, different people respond totally differently to the same foods uh, based on different factors, like their microbiome or their baseline metabolic health, or how much sleep they've had, or how much exercise they've done the day before and other factors. So knowing personal response is really critically cr critical um, for us to make the best decisions for ourselves. And Historically, this may not have been uh, such, a, such an issue for people because we were eating primarily real and whole foods throughout most of human history. But now uh, in the face of a Western culture, which is by and large based on ultra processed foods and novel food chemicals that we're eating that hijack our metabolic processes and our fundamental cellular physiology, um, lack of understanding about what we're eating is actually killing us. So, um, so levels is really um, here to, uh, our mission is to reverse the metabolic disease epidemic by empowering people with personal information so they can make better choices for their long-term health. Awesome. Um, love it. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the data you've seen to date and, and what you think it means, uh, at this point and where it's going? Absolutely. Yeah. So we've had about 15,000 people go through our beta program. We've acquired about 50 million glucose data points. Um, uh, we've had about 200 million total health data points because we also track sleep and activity data. Um, and people, our beta members have logged about 1.5 million food logs that are paired with that glucose data. So this is a absolutely massive data set of the impact of food choices on glucose levels in a non-diabetic population, um, of, of which we've really never had access to this, this type of data before. Um, in the healthcare consumer space. So what you can see here on this slide is, is just a, a snapshot of a few sort of logs that people would log and then what people's average 
uh, glucose rise is, what the average peak of that decision is, um, and then what uh, their average zone score is. So that's the a proprietary uh, levels metric that kind of gives people a score about the glucose impact of a particular uh, meal. And so what this type of data set can do for us is um, show us really for the first time what on a population level an individual food product is doing to people's uh, body. I think in a few years, we're going to see, think it's very outdated to choose foods or eat a diet that you haven't really vetted through the lens of bio-wearable data, um, which is essentially choosing foods in the dark, again, based on just food marketing and what we're sort of told uh, is good. And I think what we're seeing from this type of data set is that we're going to create con new consumer pressures on the food industry and healthcare industry to to really improve the health impact of the products they're offering and also kind of usher in an era of radical transparency um, in what, uh, what food companies sort of have to tell us about, about their products. It's no longer gonna be about convincing consumers of anything because we have our own tools to evaluate um, the outcomes and, and the impact. So um, that's something I'm really excited to see is uh, how these types of large data sets and large populations um, impact what the food industry is, is offering and how they have to share information. Additionally, this large data set can feed back into individual insights for the individual. So um, I think on the next slide, we have some um, information about like breakfast choices. So this is looking at across 15,000 people, what breakfast choices um, have great glucose scores and what breakfast choices have really poor glucose scores. And what you can see here is that some of our sort of standard American breakfasts like pancakes, Cheerios, bagel and cream cheese, French toast, these have very large glucose spikes in the um, 37 to 40 range for the post-meal glucose spike, um, getting people up to, up to about 130 milligram per deciliter in their glucose. In contrast, frittata, magic spoon cereal, chia seed pudding, um, a Fab Four smoothie, which is a smoothie, um, the a type of smoothie that's been popularized by nutritionist Kelly Levesque that has a lot of fat and protein and fiber. These have virtually no glucose response. They're in the seven to nine milligram per deciliter range. People are only getting up to a glucose of 90 to 100. So what you can start to see in these large, you know, population uh, data of glucose responses is that there are clearly types of foods for breakfast that are not going to probably um, serve your goals, whatever that is in terms of metabolic health, whether it's weight loss, longevity. And then there are some that are by and large um, going to have a minimal glucose response and keep your glucose more stable. So that type of data can then feed back towards the individual to help them make better choices based on what's happening with other people. And more broadly talking about what Sarah was uh, mentioning about glucotypes and different, different phenotypes of people within this larger population. As our ability to understand this data grows, we're gonna start to understand different types of subsets of people within the data set that kind of match other people's experiences. And so the predictive element um, of that feedback is gonna be really interesting where we can say, you know, you, you respond to foods a lot like this other set of people. So these are the foods that tend to work well for for you. So, um, so that's the type of insights, uh, an example of some of the insights we've seen so far. Great. And, um, oh, go ahead. So just a quick question. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're not pre-diabetic or you don't have diabetes, why is having, having that spike after a bowl of Cheerios, which, you know, they say, they say is good for you on the, on the package. Why is that so bad? Um, if you, if you maintain fasting glucose levels and insulin levels that are within normal or even within optimal? Yeah. So the, the impact of a glucose spike, um, has, has many, many different, uh, downstream effects. So the, there's, there's several that are, that are worth knowing about. So high glucose in the bloodstream, acute hyperglycemia, um, and this sort of up and down trend, like we saw in Sarah's graph, the red part where people were up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, that's called high glycemic variability. And we know that high glycemic variability is uh, predictive of downstream metabolic problems like diabetes, obesity, heart disease. In fact, high glycemic variability is an independent 
predictor, aside from fasting glucose, of downstream uh, metabolic problems. So we want to keep glycemic variability to a minimum. Every time we spike our glucose, um, even if our body is totally capable of bringing that back down with insulin and bringing that spike down, what we're doing is we're increasing the amount of insulin that our body is being exposed to. You have a spike and then your body re releases insulin to help take that glucose out of the bloodstream into the cells. Over time, the cells seeing so much insulin being secreted because of these glucose spikes, even if you're otherwise healthy, the body can um, form an insulin block. It's called insulin resistance, where it's seeing so much insulin that it actually puts a block on it to say, you know, that there's too much glucose coming in the cells. We need to put a sort of a, a pause on this. Um, and so over time, these spikes over and over again, even if you're bringing them down because you're, you know, young and healthy and otherwise um, doing fine over time, it can lead you down this trajectory of insulin resistance, which ultimately what is what leads to um, metabolic disease. Um, and so we really want to keep those spikes to a minimum to keep our cells really sharp and primed to respond to insulin and not um, sort of uh, having this dulled uh, insulin block effect. The other thing is, is that spikes on their own, especially high spikes can cause acute inflammation. High spikes in the blood uh, can cause a process called glycation, which is where sugar actually sticks to proteins and other molecules in the body and causes dysfunction. Um, and it can also cause oxidative stress, which is where you've overloaded the body with glucose and that creates stress in the mitochondria of our cells, which actually um, sort of blocks our metabolic functioning. So insulin resistance, inflammation, glycation, oxidative stress, these are kind of big words, but all of, all of it really focuses on keeping spikes down, keeps us metabolically um, in the place we, we wanna be. No one should fear a single spike like your body knows how to deal with it. It's these trends over time that we want to avoid and learning to eat, which you can really do rapidly with tools like continuous glucose monitor, learning to eat to keep our glycemic variability down and our glucose spikes down um, really reduces the burden of increased glycemic variability uh, over time. Awesome, thanks for that. And um, you know, one of the things I've been loving is, is not just seeing how food affects it, but also how exercise or, or a walk will. Um, and obviously you guys are focused on that uh, intensely. So what, what have you learned so far about lifestyle things other than, than what you put in your mouth? Yeah, so your glucose levels are not just a readout of what you put in your mouth, but also of the holistic set of lifestyle factors that you're engaged in, such as sleep, stress management, exercise, um, really those have a, a massive impact on, on what our glucose levels are. So we've, we've done um, several experiments looking at some of the, these lifestyle factors in um, our levels population. One was what we called the levels Coke experiment, where we shipped our members, they opted in if they wanted to join a 12 ounce can of Coke. Um, and we had them drink a can of Coke uh, one morning, um, see what their glucose response is, which here you can see it's the red dots on the graph on the left. And then the next day they drank a 12 ounce can of Coke and then took a walk, just a gentle walk um, for about a half an hour after the Coke. And what we saw was that um, in the group that did not take the walk, just drank the Coke alone, their average glucose spike was in the 160s uh, milligrams per deciliter. And after just taking a, a gentle 30 minute walk after drinking the Coke, there was an, about a 35% reduction in the glucose peak um, and the area under the curve. Um, the average spike was in the 130s with taking a walk. So um, this, this has large implications uh, if you compound this type of information uh, over time. Um, having uh, a 30% reduction in, in your glycemic variability after meal is, is a big deal. So something as simple as taking a walk, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it really has a positive impact on reducing glycemic variability. Um, we also... Uh, done some experiments actually with the WHOOP team um, where we had people use WHOOP and uh, glucose monitors. And what we saw in that is that sleep is the impact of sleep on our, our glucose. What we found is that the WHOOP recovery score, which incorporates sleep quality, um, uh, different sleep stages, resting heart rate um, and heart rate variability correlates with the levels metabolic score. So um, the, essentially, uh, the better the recovery score, 
you have, meaning sleep and, uh, and, and heart rate variability, uh, the better the glucose results are. So this is real world evidence suggesting that what we know from the research literature um, applies to uh, a non-diabetic uh, population um, that's, that's essentially trying to figure out which lifestyle decisions are going to have the highest impact for their long-term health. And, you know, I think we're, we're sometimes sort of overwhelmed with all the different things we can do in wellness and in lifestyle. Um, and to have the objective data and these integrated data streams like sleep, markers of stress, like heart rate variability and glucose to create these higher level insights for you about what is really working for you, what are the highest yield interventions for you? And then when you see those results sort of motivates you to keep them going, um, I think really um, is, is a big step up in the, in the wellness industry. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Exciting times for, for you and Levels and excited to see uh, um, where it goes. Thank you. Uh, so next we have uh, Dr. Mark Kukuzela. Um, Mark, you're a, you're a family physician, family medicine physician in, in West Virginia. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how it is practicing family health and focusing on diabetes in, in one of the most obese states um, in the country and, and what you think we can really do to, to make a dent there and, 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 other, and, you know, everywhere else. Oh, well, thank you, Tom. And um, certainly great to follow Casey and Sarah and my message parallels theirs um, in a little different population. So I work right now, I'm standing in a, a rural health hospital. It's a, called a critical access hospital, 24 bed hospital. Um, these hospitals are throughout the country and mostly underserved rural areas. And most of my patients don't have a lot of medical sophistication, access to technology. Um, but the, the message is actually very easy to communicate and even giving them simple tools as much as a simple glucometer to start with, as well as the CGMs, helps them really learn their disease and take ownership of, of their disease. So we see um, you know, people from, I'm a family doc, so we have a, a pilot study that we just submitted for IRB for obesity in children, because that's the full catastrophe right now is childhood obesity, because these children will become obese and metabolically sick adults. They're already metabolically sick children. Um, so so we, I wish we focused on that, not necessarily their BMI, but if we can capture them at the childhood level, um, work with the schools, work with uh, you know the government really in policy affecting what kids get at, at, at their school lunches, maybe we can make some impact together. But seeing the data is profound. You can't unsee what you see when you look at data you know, on biomarkers such as glucose or uh, ketones, if you're doing a low carbohydrate diet and trying to follow your results there. Cool. You mentioned that that uh, study on pediatric diabetes, and I know um, you've connected with Jim Howard, who is the CEO of iSelect portfolio company, Readout Health, doing ketone monitoring. Um, you know, curious to get your, your take on on the promise of ketone monitoring in conjunction with PrEP, perhaps other biomarkers to address this issue and, and um, how you think that will roll out in this, uh, in this pediatric uh, diabetes study you're, you're undertaking? Yeah, just a, a quick correction. It's a pediatric obesity study, but probably these children are all pre-pre-diabetic, meaning they all have fatty liver. And if we actually could measure their insulin real time, that would probably be the holy grail because then we could see which kids are hyperinsulinemic in the first grade, you know, which precedes the diabetes because kids will start pumping out more and more insulin, you know, to fill their liver with fat um, and uh, develop all the other, you know, even they start to develop cardiovascular complications even before leaving high school. But so the, the question stands, what can we give patients and their families that are simple tools that might help them adhere and learn a little better and maybe tweak the way they're eating? So children usually don't like to be stuck unless they are, you know, type one, maybe they're kind of been used to that because they started really young and, and to them it's routine, but so children really don't want to get stuck. So a breath ketone meter, I mean, maybe it, it will have a marker of which children, like we, we see which kids respond and which don't. And, are, and can we use technology to identify a group that might need more counseling, really, it's going to more support, you know, where are they getting their carbohydrates? You know, if we're seeing there's a trend in the kids that are blowing a little higher ketone level versus the ones that aren't, you know, 
is there a difference in the group um, with with weight loss? And really, waste uh, waste loss is what we really want. Same as a glucose monitor, you know, the in children, the diabetes is like the last domino to fall. You know, they're they're going to have multiple other metabolic comorbidities before they're diabetic. You know, so so they'll pump out a lot of insulin before their sugars rise. But like Casey's graphs are showing, are we going to see? You know, and Sarah mentioned the spiky pattern. Are we going to start to see a lot of spiky pattern? And as well as these hypoglycemia episodes, reactive hypoglycemia is really driving, you know, kids are hungry. And if they're hungry, they're going to eat. Why are they so hungry all the time? Unless we can answer that question, you know, we can't put kids on diets, you know, we, and, and our whole premise with low carbohydrate in children, and it's in the obesity medicine association algorithm as the most effective way to treat pediatric obesity. But I think there's a bias. Well, it's hard, you know, so I, I don't think we should be offering this because it's hard. You know, I, I live in uh, not only the most obese state, but we probably have the highest tobacco prevalence in the country too. So would we ever tell a patient or just assume, well, I, I don't think they can quit. It's hard, you know, and we're seeing patients with end-stage emphysema. You know, a lot of those patients are very susceptible to COVID now. You know, we have a whole floor uh, full of COVID patients right below me right now. So of course, we're going to give them opportunity and support to, to make the, the right choice, you know? So this is the optimum choice is to do this and we're going to support you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I know, I know you're working on, um, or you perhaps just finished a, a, another clinical trial looking at, uh, in this case, diabetics, sorry for the confusion earlier, yeah, this was uh, the, re yeah. recently no diagnosed diabetics. We'd love to hear about the, uh, about the, this trial. Yeah, this little trial we did was a pilot. Basically, it, it's a small study of Casey's big database. So um, a very low, uh, low uh, support intervention. We just gave uh, patients who are new diabetes patients, uh, Freestyle Libre CGM, gave them a guide on food and gave them like a log. So basically, it was let them teach themselves what affected their blood glucose. So we called it glucose excursion model. And it became pretty evident, you know, day one or two, what foods would raise their blood sugar. But the exercise component was interesting too. You know, some patients had a very brisk reduction in glucose with exercise, some not so much. So they kind of tuned and learned themselves. And we did this over four months, new diabetes patients. And our goal was to reverse the diabetes without medication. You know, so if you go with just standard treatment for diabetes, no one reverses their diabetes. They all manage it but the goal is to make it go away. And, and that's not possible with all patients, but I think it should be offered to anyone who wishes to give that a go. And the American Diabetes Association, Tom, has actually just acknowledged that diabetes remission is not magical thinking because uh, they made a consensus report um, defining it because the definition was all over the place. So what is it? You know, Can you be on metformin? Can you be on a GLP-1 agonist? But no, th so the and this has also followed the UK and Australia. So diabetes remission is A1C, less than 6.5, no medication, maintaining for three months. So we did a four-month trial. These were new diabetes patients, no meds, gave them the Libre. Um, my patients weren't even sophisticated enough to figure out how to upload the data onto you know, their computer. So I, I would grab their uh, reader and download it from my clinic. Um, they didn't have, uh, you know, daily support from coaches or anything. They just learned on their own and they saw us back in four months. And it was, uh, I had a group of five. We had five at UVA and five patients at University of Colorado. And they, they fit an age range of, most of them were in their 40s, 50s, 60s, um, mixed African-American, Caucasian, mixed uh, female and male. And two thirds of the patients reached diabetes remission, which is, which is pretty good, right? Compared to zero. And the average A1C reduction was two without medication held over four months. And there was kind of really robust responders. And then there were folks that, you know, kind of improved, but not dramatically. And I could share a little of my thought on that if, if we have time, just, you know, it's what I see clinically. And, and the small pilot just kind of validated, you know, who were the responders and who kind of struggled a bit. And, and that's just the real world. Sure. Um, well, super fascinating. Um, you know, we, we touched on, on the, the use of ketone monitoring for this childhood obesity study and, um, you know, interested, interested to dive a little bit deeper into, uh, how you said some folks are struggling and 
one of the things you sent me um, in, in the presentation you shared was just how many screenshots of your communication with uh, with your patients and, and those you work with. And uh, it was super impressive. Uh, obviously, these these patients think the world of you. I, I say it's a good tech side manner. I've um, never heard that term. <laughs> But, well, uh, yeah, I don't have a, a technology platform, you know, I'm in a small, these are Medicaid patients, a lot of them, Medicare, you know, I'm just, it's me and my text, and you have to give people support if they're going to reduce medications. You know, you can't have help these folks, you got to either, you help them or you don't, and I commit to people, Tom, if they're willing to do this, I commit to them 100%, you know, I will help guide them through it, they text me what their sugars are every day. You know, if they're on medications, we're going to kind of land the plane, you know, slowly reduce their medications, maybe even add a medication, you know, from a different category if we can help them achieve stable sugar. But they do, and these are really quick, inter, you know, you can see, you know, quick three seconds, look at their screen, looks good, stay the course. And when they see that support, they know you care. And, and it goes way back to the original medicine textbooks, you know, the, the most important thing about caring for patients is caring for patients. You know, they see you care. And that's something, you know, that's really not common now in healthcare, you know, that care and empathy were commodities in a lot of places, you know, we're just working, you know, for RVU components, seeing as many patients as we can, and that's what burns us out. But this brings me joy, you know, I have patients this afternoon who are coming off meds who've been sharing their screen, and it's going to be wonderful to see them, you know, really, and even give them a hug, you know, with their masks, because there are people doing things that they thought couldn't be done. And like you give them hope that they can do it. That's fantastic. Well, Dr. Mark, thank you for uh, for sharing your work here. Um, well, thanks uh, for the you, opportunity. But just real quick on the responders sure. and non-responders, you asked Please. about that. So when you talk to people about this, it's, it's almost like tobacco cessation. There's a group that get it, they're all in, they do it, their life has changed in a week. And then there are people who struggle with processed food you know, a processed food addiction, you know, Dr. Robert Lustig has written a ton about this. I think he's on in the chat, but those people struggle and they need more support because they'll try and they'll get off the wagon, try to get back on the wagon, just like people trying to quit smoking. And, and then there's a group that I'll see that just aren't ready yet. You know, they're going through a life struggle, a stress, financial crisis, you know, we're an opioid capital, you know, kid just got released from jail and they're not ready to start a lifestyle change. So that group in the middle that's struggling really wants to do it and struggling. That's how I think technology can really help because they need that daily kind of reminder from their arm, <laughs> you know, that's going to kind of bark at them a little bit. But then there's that one group that just jumps on board and does it and they're free and they're healed and they don't need us anymore. And that's a wonderful place. They're, they're healthy people again. Fantastic. Um, well, I think one of the questions we had from the audience is kind of related to, to that uh, on kind of new technology and nudges. Um, this could go for the whole the whole group, but curious to hear your thoughts on kind of most promising uh, biomarkers and biosensors coming down the pike. Um, you know, if, if you guys could have one biomarker that isn't able to be continuously measured now, what would it be? And, and what do you think the what do you think the most likely one is coming next? I could throw so I mean I mentioned the insulin I think if we could have a continuous measure of insulin to catch the pre pre diabetic you know might be something but I think most of us kind of see that with the glucose you know so the glucose lags a little bit but we see it I would uh I would definitely second that I think insulin uh would be profound for the early pre disease as that's one of the first things that we see rising even before glucose um, I think that there's, there's definitely a lot of groups working on that. I think it's going to be, uh, challenging our current biosensor technology is based on enzymatic, uh, technology, um, essentially a chemical reaction between the sensor filament and the glucose, um, and with insulin, which is a much larger protein, um, it makes it a bit more technically challenging. However, there's new technology coming down the pipeline, like aptamer based sensing that, um, may be able to. Uh, accommodate these larger um, proteins uh, in a real time way. And so I think that's, that's an area to watch. Um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of really interesting work in um, 
uh, lab uh, testing of this type of technology, but not in vivo um, uh, clinical continuous monitoring. So um, for me personally, I'd also just add on inflammatory cytokines would be really interesting. Um, cortisol, certainly to understand stress response in real time. And actually also uric acid uh, is one that I'm quite interested in. Um, uric acid is downstream of fructose metabolism um, and really highlights how, uh, while glucose is an amazing way of getting biofeedback on diet, um, it, glucose is not the end all be all in determining what the perfect diet is for you. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It tells us a lot, but um, if you just optimize for glucose, you're not necessarily gonna have a perfect diet because of course you could chug canola oil or vodka and still uh, have a fly glucose line. And so having other nutritional biomarkers that can help disambiguate how a food is affecting your body, whether that's inflammatory or something like uric acid, which is downstream of fructose, um, we can start to have a more holistic picture and be able to say very concretely, this food is great for my body or this food isn't. So glucose gets us a huge amount of the way there, but I think other nutritional downstream biomarkers like ketones, uric acid, uh, free fatty acids would be great as well. Yeah, I'll just add on, um, I agree with what's been mentioned already uh, and the challenges that we have with some of these larger molecules for continuous measurement. One of the things I'm excited about is uh, as physicians having better dashboards to be looking at some of these dense data sets. And I think Levels has taken us pretty far in terms of uh, algorithms and dashboards. In terms of your question, Tom, I'm also uh, very interested in some of the hormones that are part of the signal that changes with glucose. And as Casey mentioned, we know from pretty robust data sets like the Whitehall study that when you look at a change in glucose, upstream there's this change that happens hormonally sometimes for years before that change in glucose. So that's certainly true with insulin. It's true with adiponectin. So these are some of the hormones that I like to look at. And then some of these uh, confounders such as cortisol and stress, um, I think are very interesting. And certainly uric acid, as Casey mentioned. Fantastic. Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to type them in. Um, but curious, uh, in the few minutes remaining from each of you, what is the single most important thing somebody can do, perhaps today, to, to take a, a small step towards, towards metabolic fitness and metabolic health? What's, what's the number one thing you'd recommend? I would say for easy, sorry, Mark. Uh, okay. For easy, I would say intermittent fasting. You know, 98% of my patients can do it. Start with an eating window of 14 hours overnight. Uh, less easy is keto, a ketogenic diet, a well-formulated ketogenic diet. But easy is definitely intermittent fasting. Sorry, Mark. Oh, no, no. Ladies first. Um, here, I actually drew this thing. It's a little white paper, Optimum Health and Disease. So I think the most important thing you can figure out for yourself is where are you on that scale, you know, and self-quantify, you know, if you're not in optimal health, that's why, you know, seeing someone like Sarah, if you were a, a patient, she would take probably two hours with you and help you figure out what your issues are. Most people I see have no idea that they're even pre-diabetic, you know, so they, they, they don't even know what they have, so they can't even begin to help themselves. So talk to, you know, a clinician that actually understands prevention and metabolic health. So, you know, what's your scorecard <laughs> and not just the five markers, right? That's disease, right? We want to catch it early. So just figure out where you are and what your levers are to get better in your life. You know, it's got to fit within in your life. You know, most of us are busy and budgets, you know, we, we have to deal with, with the financials of, of affordable food. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. I would echo both of those wholeheartedly and um, building off of what uh, Dr. Mark said, uh, almost everyone has a cholesterol panel. A lot of us don't have a fasting insulin test, which ideally all doctors would order, but we all have a cholesterol panel. So even just looking at something like 
are just calculating from our last cholesterol test, our triglyceride to HDL ratio, which can be a signal um, directionally of whether we are insulin resistant um, and look to see what that is. Um, you know, ideally less than one a ratio would be great. Um, but as you're creeping up, you know, two to one, three to one, four to one, you start, you know, recognizing that there may be something happening with insulin resistance. So that's a really simple way for you yourself today to take a look. There's actually a blog post that we put together that includes a lot of um, Dr. Gottfried's input um, called the ultimate, uh, the ultimate guide to understanding um, your cholesterol uh, test. So that's on the levels blog. And it's just can walk you through exactly how to look at your cholesterol panel and understand your level of metabolic health from it um, in a more nuanced way than what you might get from your doctor. So that's one thing. And then I think for a practical tip, I would just say, um, you know, the biggest thing we can do is eliminate uh, excess refined carbohydrates and, and sugars um, and eat more, you know, whole, real, colorful food. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Please join me in a uh, big virtual round of applause for uh, Dr. Scott Fried Means Kukazella. Thanks so much for for joining us today. Uh, go check them out. They're they're prolific on social media. Um, go read their books. Uh, they're digital or you know for purchase. Um, really cool stuff. And again, thank you all for uh, for for joining us this morning. It's been it's been great. And to those in attendance, thank you for uh, for participating. As a reminder, we host these. Uh, deep dives once a month. Uh, we alternate between topics in food and health and agriculture. Next month, uh, my colleague David Yoakum will be presenting on the future of cheese, um, be it from a animal or otherwise. Um, so hope to see you soon and hope everyone has a great day and happy holidays. Thank you all.